and he is the director of the Institute for Human Health and Performance at the University College London. He obtained his a first-class degree in neuropharmacology and cardiorespiratory physiology in 1984. He graduated from the Middlesex Hospital Medical School in 1987. He has since trained in the, to specialist status in general internal medicine, cardiology, and intensive care. He is now professor of intensive care medicine and director of the Institute for Human Health and Performance, University College London, where he leads a research group. He's published over 200 scientific articles, and he's been engaged in climate change and health for more than 10 years. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Hugh Montgomery. I doubt there's a more important gathering of people in the whole of Durban at the moment than you. And I doubt that I will ever have given a more important talk than that that I'm about to give. Because I'm a Brit, though, I need to start with a joke before I get to the serious stuff. So here's my one climate change joke. Not many people know a climate change joke, but I do. So one planet's talking to another planet. And it says, I don't feel so good. I think I've got homo sapiens. <laughs> and the other planet says, oh, I wouldn't worry, it doesn't last for long. This is where I work, and this is the sort of patient I look after. And sometimes patients like this end up on our intensive care unit dying and die because of some catastrophic event that's befallen them. They're hit by a truck. But far more often, they end up there because they become chronically sick. That makes them vulnerable when that second hit arrives. And I'd like to start by giving a brief outline of the chronic sickness that our world faces before we move on to that second hit. Here's human population. Whoever drew this graph probably got it wrong because humans didn't really turn up until around 140, 150,000 years ago. And there weren't very many of us around, probably around 70,000 years ago. There were no more than probably 5,000 breeding pairs on the planet. And it took us till around 1804 to get our first billion, and it took well over 120 years to get our next. But as we've worked our way up, we find that we're adding now another billion to our planet every 11 or 12 years. And each of those individuals, on average across the planet, has more money. That's not to say there isn't gross inequity in the world. Those of us such as me, who live in central London, who fly to COP17s, who carry a mobile phone and use computers, use a vastly disproportionate amount of the Earth's resources than do others in poorer countries. But look at the data here. The amount of money per capita screaming upwards in these 1990 adjusted dollars. World economy, in 1990 dollars, 600 billion in 1800, 4,000 billion in 1950, somewhere approaching 61 trillion in 2010, with average earnings per capita around the world rising steeply. The point I'm making is that those dollars are underpinned by resources, the resources that we all hold as common goods, the water, the soil, the rivers, the seas. And we're systematically destroying them. Here are the data just on fish stocks, 1961 to 2003. World population then had grown at 1.8% a year. Fish consumption going up 3.6% a year. 17 kilograms per capita. And once again, a larger proportion of that being eaten in very rich nations. The result, fish stocks are collapsing. 40% of our fish stocks have collapsed already. We're having to grow more. World grain production having to rise, having to rise. But we've run out of land. This is underpinned by increased use of fertilizer, driven by fossil fuel use to do that, not by a particularly great increase in land mass, because we've run out of the places to which we can grow grain. That said, we are having to use more land. 
We're grazing more cattle. This is world meat production, rising steadily. Now standing at 45 kilograms of meat per person. Again, Western nations, developed nations, consuming far more than their rightful share. And growing those crops and keeping those cattle means we need to use more land. <coughs> this is why rainforests are disappearing. And they're not disappearing slowly. That means more water. I'll let you look at these figures for yourselves. And as a result of this, the world has water crises pretty much everywhere because a great deal of the water we consume comes from fossil aquifers. aquifers. These are sealed reservoirs of water that once empty do not refill. And when they go, large numbers of people suffer. And we know, for instance, that Saudi Arabia's grain crop rise by 71% uh, shortly after the year 2000 because of the loss of that water, which is why they're having to buy land elsewhere. All of that means less life. This from the Living Planet Index, which there's a new one just released 2010, actually. These are the changes that have happened since I was 20 years old. This is the biggest mass extinction that the planet has seen on the fossil record. And we're living through it now. Our planet's very sick indeed. That patient is already teetering on the brink. And if it suffers another blow, it will die. Especially if that blow is sudden and severe. Now, people talk about climate change as being a natural phenomenon. Yes, climate change has always changed, but notice these things, the changes in tilt, wobble and precession, these are happening in orbital cycles, are happening over geological timescales. The change that we're generating today is happening over matters of decades. It's important because climate change is not just about dollars. It's about lives. It's about suffering. It's about survival. And that's why the Lancet made the statement that it's did. Not just because climate change has its direct impacts on health and survival, but as the minister made clear in his talk before, it's a force multiplier. Existing threats, existing problems are massively amplified when climate change bites. When you talk to most people, the medical students here did a survey of delegates and negotiators last year, and they said to them, do you think climate change is a problem for health? A very large number had no idea that climate change had anything to do with people. And those that did felt that it was probably something a bit to do with malaria, and quotes, the WHO can probably sort that out. <laughs> There's a lot more to it. As temperatures rise, bacterial doubling rates increase, which is why you tend not to get so much diary of meat and chicken in England, which is generally a pretty chilly place, and you do if you go to warmer countries, because bacteria grow more quickly. The risk of malaria in some areas will definitely drop as swamps dry out and it becomes inclement, but in some areas it will rise. These were data, bear in mind, from low to mid-range estimates from 10 years ago. And as I've explained, we're way past those low-range estimates. So bear in mind, a lot of these scenarios are pathetically <coughs> lightweight. Things will be much worse. Red represents the certainty of malarial transmission. And this was estimates on low to mid-range risk in the next 50 years. Why? Because in warmer climates, mosquitoes can live. As the temperature goes up, the malarial parasite replicates faster inside the mosquito, so the mosquito becomes infected more quickly. And this applies to other things like dengue. The viral incubation period shortens, the breeding cycle of the mosquito shortens, and they feed more frequently because they're buzzing around a lot more when it's warmer. Higher temperatures kill. We are evolved 
as multi-celled organisms over 540 million years to a very niche range of temperatures. And as temperatures rise, mortality rates rise. So these are just deaths in the United Kingdom. As it gets warmer, people die more. And you can see that anywhere in the world. These are data from Delhi, just a few seasons showing seasonal changes. But as it gets warmer, people die. As it gets cooler, people don't. This is just a function of human biology. Increased baseline temperatures change levels of pollutants. And these are physicochemical reactions from pollutants. So tailpipe exhaust emissions in New York, concentrations of ozone rise, as temperatures rise. That's not because more cars are on the road, it's because of the nature of the chemistry of the atmosphere. And ground level ozone is very harmful to the respiratory tracts of humans. We change the way in which pollen is released. Pollen seasons lengthen. They start earlier, they go on longer. Many plants produce more pollen as it's warmer. And there is a shift in some species, and we're looking particularly um, at ragweed pollen, to much more allergenic forms of pollen around the world. But as you put more energy into a meteorological system, that energy appears in the form of weather. Now, the recent UN report said that it couldn't say with confidence that previous increases or recent increases in extreme weather events can be said to be due to climate change. But those of us that are scientists and physicians in this audience understand well that lack of evidence is not the same as evidence of lack. And somehow we have to account for this increase in extreme weather events over recent decades. And even in the United States, increase in tornadoes. The point I'm trying to make here is developed nations in many ways feel that they are secure from these effects of climate change. And they are not. Just as there's a global economy, we live in a global atmosphere. And every nation will be affected. I'm going to make reference to this report uh, in the future. I just put it up there so that you know the source as we move forwards published in November of this year, last month. <coughs> Cyclone wind intensity will increase as you warm ocean surfaces. Hurricanes become stronger. And we've seen strong hurricanes and the damage they cause. But we're going to see more of that sort of damage. We know that when you get these extreme weather events, soils become unstable due to Drying, glacial retreat, sudden downpours, producing catastrophic landslide. These are likely to increase. High confidence. There's some myth about rainfall and climate that some areas will become less fertile because there'll be a little less water, it'll be warmer. Other areas will be more CO2, warmer, more rainfall, more crops. That's a nonsense, because even if you get that improvement in ability to grow crops, one sudden downfall, one big drought at the wrong time, and that crop is written off. And we are likely to see increases in severe precipitation events. And indeed, we are. I don't think we need to look further than Pakistan, which suffered horribly a fifth of its land area underwater last year, Many, many millions of people affected and crops lost. We think of Vietnam and Thailand now, similarly affected, and their people suffering. Coastal flooding will worsen because of extreme storms, sea level rise, and so forth. This is likely to get worse. We're seeing these events already. And we're going to see more extreme heat waves. These are the anomalies for June 2010. Some areas cooler than you'd expect. Some areas, the red dots, very, very much warmer. August 2003, heat wave in Europe killed perhaps up to 75,000 people. And
And we're going to see more of these according to that UN report. Look here. Very likely the length and intensity and severity of these heat wells will rise. A one in 20 year hottest day is likely to become a one in two year event. Think of Russia last year. Massive droughts leading to forest fires. <coughs> Vast areas affected, crops failing. Large areas unable to export wheat. And these sorts of events, flooding, drought, extreme weather, means there's a shortage of food. Shortage of food makes it become more expensive. Then people start speculating on the price of food and it drives the price up further. Which is all very well if you live in central London on a doctor's salary. It's not acceptable when you're living on the breadline in a poorer nation state and you can no longer feed your family. We know from Nixterns data that climate change will be catastrophic to economies and we know that poverty drives ill health. And we know that when you have starvation and drought and loss of habitation and disease and poverty, people will move. And when they move into other areas that are similarly distressed, you get conflict. This even from 2003 from a Pentagon report, the result could be a significant drop in the human carrying capacity of the Earth's environment. That's talking about deaths. And they're not alone in saying this. We co-authored an article for the British Medical Journal just recently, drawing on statements from the International Institute for Strategic Studies, from the CIA, from organizations that you and I would perhaps not normally consider to be the most liberal organizations in the world. But they are concerned. <coughs> I was deeply impressed with the Minister's words earlier on. I've been to many meetings about climate and health. He's believe it's not the first person I've heard that actually starts talking about ecosystem effects. Because we're at the top of an ecological pyramid and if that collapses beneath us, our foundations are lost. Again, this paper now some seven years old, and from what I've told you before, we're now exceeding the worst case scenarios that have been predicted by the IPCC earlier on. This happening on top of that mass extinction event about which I spoke earlier. So the question then, have we a terminal disease now? Or is there a cure? I don't know. If there is a cure, it's in your hands. And that's why you are the most important people in Durban today. Because no one else is listening. And they have to listen. And they have to listen urgently to you. We need to inform patients. We need to inform our colleagues. We need to inform our politicians. Because if you work in health, unlike politicians generally in the world, or bankers, you're trusted to speak the truth. You must speak this truth of the risks, but also the benefits. In Western worlds, if we substitute driving for walking, we get reductions in diabetes, obesity, stroke, coronary vascular disease, peripheral vascular disease, hypertension, depression, dementia, breast cancer, bowel cancer. As a Western white male in Britain, the second most likely thing from which I will die is bowel cancer. And any of you who have seen someone die of that disease, it's horrible. The biggest preventable cause is saturated fat consumption from red meat and red meat consumption. Reducing those, taking more exercise, benefits the planet and it benefits the health of our country. It benefits our health economics. We have a good selling point here and Andy Haynes will be here this afternoon to show that not only does this apply to Europe, huge fiscal savings, but he modeled this around the world for different countries, of different levels of poverty, different cities, and showed, I won't go through these in detail, except to say, very big advantages wherever you are in the world.
This is a convenient truth, and we need to communicate this. You need to take personal actions, and we need to advocate and engage. This is Jean-Paul Sartre, and I want to remind you of his words. It is not right to want to heal the suffering of people without committing to fight the very causes of that suffering. We have a responsibility here today to do this. We have a responsibility not to sit on the sidelines of these negotiations, to think that we're marginal to them. The health message is central. Our politicians must understand that people are suffering and dying now, and that very, 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 very many more will suffer and die in the future unless they act now. The talk about delays for eight years are a frank nonsense, and we must say so, to our ministers and to those that we know. These are personal thoughts. I'm not going to suggest that they're the thoughts of this conference, or there is a conference statement I'd encourage you to read and sign. We need to know what we're missing. We need to fill the gap. We need an urgent negotiated deal that's meaningful. We need to measure where we are. We need to put the money into the system. We need to make it available to those countries that need it. And we need to give them power over its use. And we need to sort out deforestation. Those are just headlines. They're personal views, but I think you may or may not agree. And we need to stand up for what's right. Waiting for everyone else to do something before you do does not show moral leadership. So from where I come from, the EU, in my view, should just go ahead anyway, making its reductions. Finally, this statement will be circulated. It is circulating. Some nation states have already signed up to it. We're asking negotiators in their opening plenary sessions to start their negotiations with these words. We'll circulate those for you. It will show solidarity amongst those states to say this is a matter of urgency. And I'm finishing now, so Josh can not worry too much because I'm sticking to time. The point I want to make is that if we spend another eight years with 40,000 delegates coming to COP processes such as this, neatly drafting a prescription for our planet, the patient will have died by the time we finish that prescription. And that matters. And it matters to me. And it matters to me personally. This is Fergus. He's my youngest son. And I love him every bit as much as you love your children or your grandchildren. And if you're not going to do this for other people's children, you must do it for your own. Because let me remind you, this isn't a joke. I think I've got homo sapiens. Don't worry. They won't last for long.